Marty, thanks for the kind words. It's actually a, a blessing to us to be able to do this. So good to see you guys tonight. We're, uh, as it says, we're talking about the Holy Land. We're on part three, our third talk and final talk on, on our trip and what we're going to share with you. And uh, then Marty's talked to me about uh, beginning in a few a number of weeks, doing about every fifth or so or fourth, fifth, whatever, uh, Wednesday talk on current events in Israel, which we... Okay, thank you. It's out of my job description. That better? Okay, good. Is that better? Okay, good. So anyway, uh, we're here tonight to go through this, and uh, as usual, as you all know by now, I do the facts, and... I do the feelings. <laughs> so, so, again, we got facts and feelings for you all tonight. And um, so if you have any questions, certainly just stop and, and let us know. And uh, we started, we ended with this slide last time we talked. And so it's a good place to start and just another little remembrance that although we've got some fun things to share with you about and some interesting things to look at, you know, this is the reason right here. It's the reason we're all here tonight. And I do appreciate y'all coming. So tonight we're going to, just a little preview so you'll know what's coming. Uh, we're going to talk about the upper room uh, leading off from last, last week. And we're also then we're going to talk about the Dead Sea. Tonight we're going to have, I guess, less scriptural or shall I say biblical points to talk about. Um, for instance, the, the Dead Sea is not listed much in the Bible. Masada is not listed in the Bible, but it's important. Uh, en Gedi, it's a fun place that we're going to talk about as well. Qumran, which is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were written. We'll show a few slides on that. Starting with this slide, though, this uh, may be familiar to you if you were at our other talks. This is a picture out of our hotel room. The reason I brought it up there again, oh, I can see it up there, thank you, is the, right in the middle, Mount Zion area of the upper room. So I put this slide up again to help you understand where the upper room is because that's kind of next on our, our trip here. Uh, this is a picture of the upper room in Jerusalem. A couple of things about this. It's based on some archaeological findings under this house in which this room is. But it's important to understand that a lot of things in Israel are traditional places and maybe not, shall we say, actual places. Um, because it's hard to know exactly where something was 2,000 years ago. So I always like to point out when we're talking which places are real and definite and which places are maybes. But as I've said before, if this isn't the exact place of the upper room, and it isn't quite, um, it's within a few hundred yards of here because we, we know generally where it happened. And also, um, when you think of the upper room, the homes back then were not very tall, even for the first floor. So the upper room might not have even been a room where they could even stand all the way up. So they would have been at a, probably a lower table, sitting on the floor and taking the Lord's Supper that way. Right. But this room actually was built during the Crusader time, maybe around 1200 AD. We, we know that just from the architecture there. Let's see. So, I can't read that from there. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I didn't even need my glasses. Can you read that? Yes, I can. All right. Have at it. On the first day of the Festival of Unleavened Bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent us two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house, He enters. The teacher asks, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. 
You know, what an amazing time that was to imagine those men eating in that room, Jesus knowing with certainty, of course, this was his last supper with them. Uh, I don't know how many of them knew besides him with certainty exactly what was going to happen. But this place is at least a memorial site for that event. Um, something else happened in the upper room, which I'm sure most of you all remember. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from the heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in the tongues as the Spirit enabled them. That's quite, it's just, we've all read that and we've seen it read, but when you think and imagine just the incredible things that happened there, it's part of being in Israel that's just kind of hard to convey. There's just such a feeling, <laughs> oh, I'm getting into feelings now, uh -oh. a feeling <laughs> getting in her territory. <laughs> would you like to talk about the feelings of Israel? Yes. No, oh, I figured you would. When you go to these places and you see them knowing that Christ was there with his disciples and from the scriptures you've read all your life and to actually be where he was it's it's really kind of hard to get your head around it to and you read the bible differently after being at these places and uh, it was it's just so hard to put into words that's why she does the feelings we're going to uh, take a trip now to the Dead Sea and start visiting a little bit about that. Um, I put this map up there for several reasons, just again to orient you geographically. Uh, it's about 30 miles east of Jerusalem, uh, 50 miles long, 10 miles wide, a lot bigger than that body of water, the Sea of Galilee that we talked about. It's uh, very deep, about 1,000 feet deep. And the surface of it is 1,500 feet or so below sea level. So as you're leaving Jerusalem and going down, 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 it's a weird feeling to pass a sign on the side of the road that says sea level and on land and you're going down below it. Uh, has no water outlet. It's the lowest place on, on planet Earth. The inlet is the, the Jordan River, which flows into the northern part up there near Jericho. But uh, some sites we're going to talk about is Qumran, in Gedi, in Masada. Uh, these are really fascinating places to visit over there. So the Dead Sea, it's 10 times saltier than ocean water, has a full 34% of it is salt. It's extremely salty, to, to put it mildly. Um, so these factors make the water so dense, it's floating in it. It's, I mean, it's just impossible to sink, uh, which we can let this lady tell us about. <laughs> yeah, you, you absolutely cannot sink in the Dead Sea, but you don't want to get it in your mouth either because it can actually kill you if you get it. Um, because of the salt, it would expand your esophagus and make it where you can't breathe. Um, so it's good that your head doesn't go underwater. But yeah, go ahead. It, it is a really weird feeling to uh, back to feelings uh, to to be floating. So if you can't float on your back or your stomach, you can there. What's your question? No. No. It's nothing grows in it. So salty. No, nothing lives in it. It's called the Dead Sea for a reason. Uh, also in the Bible, referred to as the Salt Sea in a few places. Yeah. But, but it, yeah. It is great for your your skin. The mud. Uh, is, has the minerals in it. Um, they do sell that, um, the Dead Sea mud. And all the, the salt crystals are absolutely beautiful, and they're everywhere. I mean, you can everywhere. just pick them up because they reform um, all the time. And the Dead Sea has dropped considerably, so there's now a point 
between Israel and Jordan where you can literally walk from one side to the other. It's some distance away, but not, not right on the shore. Nothing at all. It's, uh, it's lost a lot of volume, like Liberta said, just due to poor rain intake. Uh, the Jordan River, a lot of countries have diverted flow from it for their own use. So it's just not, not getting the, the feed in that it once did. But yeah, the health benefits, Liberta mentioned, for thousands of years, people have traveled to the Dead Sea for health benefits. Um, the air there, it's, the air itself is different. It's, it's thicker because you're 1,500 feet you know, further down in sea level. Um, and it, it has a, an aroma to it. I don't want to call it a smell. It's not a bad smell, but you can just like smell the sulfur. chemicals. At times, it's, it's sulfury. It's where Sodom and Gomorrah were, down there in the very tip of the Dead Sea. So still sulfur down there that you can literally pick up and burn put a match to it and it'll burn. Not right at this spot. It's at a different spot. But people have traveled there for thousands of years, particularly skin diseases, you know, to bathe in the water and then lay in the sun. So it's been used as uh, that for a long time. So there's no doubt that it helps psoriasis and other skin disorders. Um, as far as health benefits, I put this in quotation marks because they claim that the mud also <laughs> will help your health. So Liberta wanted to try it out. And, you know, she was having so much fun, I had to get in too and try. So, anyway. <laughs> the bottom or is something different? It's actually, Liberta, where was it? I, it's not common to have it there. I don't know if they brought some up for people to put on them or, uh, or what. They actually have brought it up and they've put it in these barrels. You kind of see it looks okay. like it. Uh-huh. So, because anyway. the water itself is very, very clear when you walk in. And totally. In the totally clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's all rock. Yeah, no, no sand. It's pure. Right. It's towards the southern end, but the Jordan flow is so minimal now. It's just really sad. You know, when we've been there before and we've seen the Jordan just rushing into it, it's almost a trickle now. We we went to a place that's another traditional site of the baptism of, of Jesus on this trip. It was part of a trip that we did um, down to Jericho as well. But there, it was just not nice. It was dirty and yucky Sewage. and it's just not nice at all. So it's just really deteriorated in the years. Qumran. Uh, is a fascinating place. Qumran is a place on the Dead Sea, it's more uh, as you start dropping down from the tip of it. It's a place where the Dead Sea Scrolls were written. The Dead Sea Scrolls are really important. They were discovered in 1947, and they contain all uh, parts of all of the Old Testament, at least fragments of every single book in the Old Testament, except the book of Esther. And they can be read as if you opened the Bible today and read. There's grammatically correct, um, which shows that our Bible has remained constant in what it contains all during this time for over 2,000 years. Um, there's, uh, this shows the, the cave where they were found. Some shepherd boys were playing around back in 47 through a rock up in this cave you see here and they heard pottery shattering. And the parents went up there the next day and found these pottery uh, jars, and that's where these, these scrolls were. And so that's a, just a picture of it from a little bit more distance just to give you a scale idea. And they were probably put there during the siege of Jerusalem when they were trying to save the Bible. Right. And that is in Israel. Yes. The, um, the book of Isaiah, you see on the left, 
And the, this, all of the Dead Sea Scrolls now are pretty much housed in this place called the Shrine of the Book. And that just shows a, you know, a replica of the top of a, of a scroll. And then that's the literature around the edge. And, you know, I, I can read and, and write Hebrew. I, I don't understand it all the time, but I can at least read it. And I could go up to that and actually read the Hebrew words that are 2,000 years old, unchanged in this period of time. And I believe that the, that's what the outside looks like. And that's, they keep yeah. it watered down. And I always wondered, you know, looking on the inside, it kind of looks like a piece of pottery. So were they trying to remodel mm -hmm. it to kind of look like a piece of pottery where so. the, the scrolls were? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. En Gedi, it's a fun place. En Gedi is, uh, it's mentioned in the Bible. Liberta's going to read that. But uh, it's back, again, on the shores of the Dead Sea. Um, <laughs> Liberta saw that rock up above, and I said, yeah, last week it was in the newspaper. It rolled about 75 yards and lodged right there. And you see the expression on her face on the right right there. <laughs> you want to talk yeah. about En Gedi? <laughs> All the way up the walkway, they had danger of rolling rocks and animals do not touch them you know and they show these sweet little rodent like things and we saw one and it was acting like it was going to attack us so but uh, it's actually quite beautiful the walk up there and this is where david cut the robe of saul in that cave and i wanted to read the the scripture of it um, and then we'll uh, show a few more pictures of it. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crag of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterwards, David was conscious stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, my Lord, the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated him with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you this day? You have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into the hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hands on my Lord because he is the Lord anointed. See my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I'm guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me. But my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evil doers come evil deeds. So my hand will not touch you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Who are you pursuing? A dead dog, a flea? Maybe the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just now told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy... Does he let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. 
I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. So David gave his oath to Saul. Then Saul returned home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. You know, we, we talk about the steps of Jesus because, you know, that's our Savior. He did so much for us there in that ground. And, uh, but again, we think a lot, too, when we're there about the Old Testament men and women, the stories that happened there, you know, the Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, all of these great men of the, the Bible. They, they did their part for our salvation there as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you go back to those? Yeah. It's at the end of the And Getty Trail is where the waterfall is. Is that, is that correct? The, at the very bottom, like right there, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll go through those from here, Hunter. Uh, at the very bottom, it's, it's fairly dry, but as you go up this gorge, it just progressively becomes more and more green and, and water and just beautiful. Yes. Yeah, spring. Yes, it's fresh water. In fact, when we get to Masada, which we're about to in a minute, this is where the Romans had to walk, all the horses, I guess, too, from the encampment around Masada all the way to En Gedi to get water and then carry it back. It's roughly about 15 miles, I'd say. Pretty good trek. And this is pretty hot down there, too. Pretty, pretty hot weather they have. It's just beautiful between the water. You know, it's, it's so desert down there. I mean, everything is dead until you get to an oasis like this, which this is truly an oasis. It's just really pretty. And it just brings the Bible back alive. You know, those scriptures of Saul and David. So you can see there, um, you can see where En Gedi is, about halfway down, then the Masada. And I'd say that's roughly 12 miles, give or take. So this is Masada. It's not in the Bible. It's purely a, a historical place. But it's critically important, especially when it comes to the mindset of the Israelis. Um, the story here is that as Jesus prophesied in the year 70 AD, Jerusalem was burned, destroyed, sacked, the temple torn down so truly not one stone was left upon another, just like Jesus promised. The Jews of that time had rebelled against Rome. Rome comes in in the year 70 AD and just destroys Jerusalem. Uh, it is said that they killed a million Jews during that short period of time that they were crucifying as many as 500 a day, every single day, different crucifixions going on. That, that's just one of many, many examples. So a group of Jews fled from Jerusalem to Masada. Uh, King Herod previously had built up Masada as his fortress. Uh, King Herod was a very paranoid uh, king, and he, was, he built this mainly for his own protection. And it's quite a place when you talk about a fortress. I mean, this thing is huge. You're going to see in slides here in a minute just how steep this is. Well, the Romans knew that this group had fled, and these were the last remaining Jews of the area. And Rome being Rome, they would do whatever it took to put them down, kill them, get rid of them, because the status of Rome depended on that. So they sent 5,000 troops uh, to Masada, where on top of Masada there were like 967 Jews, just under 1,000 left. But this place could be farmed. They could have crops up there. You're going to see pictures of water cistern where they had enough water 
in this arid, absolutely almost rainless area, they stored amazing amounts of water. Uh, and we'll look at that in a little bit. But that's one way to get up Masada. It's called the Snake Path for obvious reasons. Uh, Laberta and I walked that. We got up uh, about 3 a.m. one morning and drove there before it got too hot. And just as the sun was coming up, we, we started up that. We've done it. We won't do it again. Uh, <laughs> uh, in a straight line, I don't know. The actual path, I don't know. It's a long way, and most of it, of course, is up. On that picture and we on there. We didn't climb it this last trip. We took the cart yeah. up. Yeah, these, some of these photos are from 12 years ago when we were last there. Yeah, we, we took the gondola up this trip. Yeah. But you can see on that right picture, this is one reason this was an unassailable fortress. I mean, on, on three and a half sides, this is what anybody trying to get up would be facing. So it was incredibly strong. Uh, <laughs> Very high, too. Yeah, this um, is going down to Herod's Palace that is built on one side of, the, of Masada. And it's, it's steep. And I do have a little bit of an issue with heights. Your feelings are coming back. Yes. <laughs> Feeling of being scared to death. <laughs> <laughs> the Romans uh, encircled Masada. The method of their sieges of uh, cities, they would build camps, and this is one of seven or eight large encampments, still standing from 2,000 years ago. And then they built these encampments, and then between these encampments, they had stone uh, walls, which you can't really see in this, but they're obviously quite, very visible today. Another picture here, just to kind of try to let you get an idea of how steep uh, the, I mean, it's just a straight drop, drop forever on most of the sides, except for one, which we'll get to in a moment. Uh, it's how the Romans got up there. But anyway, this is a picture kind of showing how steep it is. And then <laughs> this picture here is one of Liberta's favorites. This man was walking down to Herod's palace with this child, and I was just knowing that <laughs> that, that kid was going to fall over the edge. <laughs> I was about to have an anxiety attack for that poor child. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I was too, and I don't have that many feelings, but it's kind of like, poof, <laughs> and that kid is gone. I don't think he got father of the year that year in his real. Um, some of the ruins up on top of Masada, they're <clears throat> fairly well preserved in many areas. Uh, just going to see some pictures of just some of the stuff that's left. You, this, feel the, you will see black lines kind of to the left of that picture, and below that is the original, and above it is what they have rebuilt. After 2,000 years and a number of earthquakes, obviously a lot of the walls had fallen down, but they, they wanted people to know what was traditional and what was authentic, and that's why that black line is, you can kind of see it there on the left a little bit. This is a synagogue. Um, those of you that might have seen the last synagogue, you see the identical design, the three or four rows of benches for the men to sit on, and the, the pillars there. Then she got into trouble again trying to push this over, but thank God, thank God it didn't go anywhere. If she can't tear it up, nothing will. This is one of the cisterns. Uh, Liberta, this is one of your favorite places. You take this. I'd waited 12, 13 years to see the cistern because we'd been on Masada seven hours on the first trip, and we never made it to this end of Masada. There's so much to see there. These pictures, we could literally talk hours on Masada alone and show pictures, but we don't. We're not going to do that. Go ahead. But it was really, really steep. Um, the steps were really tall for me. Uh, going down was difficult. Going up was like a step like this, and then holding on to the railings to pull myself back up. But this is a water cistern where they had a water system that when it did rain, that it filled up there. So they had plenty of water to bathe, to for sacrament, to be cleansed, uh, for drinking as well. And 
it was just enormous. And that's Randy at the base of it. And we were down there by ourselves because, again, most of the tourists go to the right side of Masada where Herod's um, palace is. And I'd waited 12, 13 years to see that. <laughs> the, the walls have plaster on them, which is still present. So that's how we know it's a water cistern. And amazing, it's just huge. The picture does not <clears throat> really do it justice. And there are 14 water cisterns uh, all together there. Not all are that big, no, no. This is just, I think, maybe the biggest, not sure. Yeah, but the, uh, <clears throat> the Jews, when the Romans were coming in, uh, chose to leave all the water they had, leave all of the food they had. The traditional thing was to get rid of it. They left it so the Romans would know that they didn't win because they were starved or, you know, thirsting to death. Uh, they won by their own choice which I guess now is a good time to tell the story. Uh, on the left, you can see some big ballista balls, as they're called, stones that were thrown over the side on the Romans trying to come up. Picture on the right is part of what's called Herod's Palace. It's on the very northern tip. And just still, you can see beautiful colors where they plastered the walls and then painted over the plaster. Uh, beautiful mosaic floors scattered here and there, still in their original condition. And this is kind of the end of the story on Masada. <clears throat> the Romans were incredible engineers, and they got there, and the question was, how do we get up there and get to these Jews that have been holding out for three years? They built a ramp, and they just amazing to me to look at it to this day as many times as I've seen it that's just a basket full of dirt and rock at a time you can see the size of the valley that they had to fill in with this fill dirt and this in 2,000 years the ramp has obviously deteriorated but it was actually much higher and taller than this and then on the top it was 60 feet wide they had it, big paving stones put on it, and from there they brought their siege machines up to pound down the walls. And uh, they and they used Jewish slaves to build it because they knew that the Jewish individuals on top would not try to hurt them. So they held out for quite a while, but finally it became inevitable that the Romans were going to break in. The typical game plan for the Romans when they controlled an area was to, you know, rape the women, to carry them off into slavery, to carry the men into slavery unless they killed them. And the Jews didn't want anything like that done. So they chose, and this is all literally recorded uh, as to what happened, they chose that there were 960 or 70 people there, including women and children, and so they decided they did not want that to happen to them or their family, so they chose mass suicide uh, instead. So they knew the Romans were going to break in the next morning, so that night the male member of the household killed uh, his own children and wife, and then the men killed each other, and then the last one killed himself. And there were, I think, three women and two children that lived through this. They had hidden, and so they were able to tell the story of what happened. So when the Romans broke in, there was just silence, and that was their choice. So that's, that's a good lean in towards where we're going to talk about in you know, the next few weeks. Uh, we're going to be talking about Jews and modern-day history, modern Israel, conditions in the Middle East. So this mindset in the Jews is still there. They have a saying, the Masada shall not fall again. So whatever it takes, Israel is not going to fall again, no matter what Iran says. So it's just that helps understand their mind. And any questions for three minutes? <laughs>